of .NET as it relates to COM. First, uh, actually activating COM classes in .NET is fairly simple. It's all sort of built in, and it's, you can either do it via reflection uh, from its pro programmatic ID, its prog ID, or its class ID. Just create a type, pass it to the activator, you create a COM object. You can also use a special syntax where you annotate a class with the COM import attribute, specify a GUID attribute, which is your class ID for your COM object, and then you can just new that COM object, and it, it creates it for you. And what the actual result of that is, is something called a runtime callable wrapper. And this is a sort of .NET object which is created, which wraps that COM server and ver therefore exposes things like the COM interfaces to a managed client. Now, to actually talk to this COM object, there's no actual interfaces directly implemented on the RCW itself. Instead, you have to have a Donna interface that you can actually use to talk to it. So, for example, in this case, we have, say, an iPersist interface, which is a fairly standard COM interface, and you define a GUID again. This time, it's the interface ID, and you say, for example, iPersist is derived from the iUnknown interface, and therefore, it's uh, you annotate that with this interface type attribute. Now, when it actually boils down to IL code, uh, it looks something like this. And it's interesting to note that the com import attribute isn't actually real. It's a, something called a pseudo attribute. This is actually a flag on the com, def, uh, on the class definition. And the class definition just has an import. And this kind of demonstrates the sort of link between the .NET world and the com world. And, and that they're actually fairly well entwined because it's actually sort of codified inside .NET itself. So that's sort of if you want to call com from .NET, but what about calling .NET from com? And uh, if you saw Casey's talk about this earlier with .NET to JScript, uh, this is the sort of scenario we're looking at here. So in this particular case, what happens is the .NET runtime course creates something called a com callable wrapper. And effectively, the com callable wrapper implements the ABI for com calling, implements all the interfaces, implements things like query interface, and effectively then just wraps that .NET object. So if that .NET object, for example, has a COM implemented interface on it, it will be exposed to a COM client. And the COM client, as far as it can tell, doesn't realize it's talking to a .NET object, or at least that's the theory. One of the things you do need to do, generally, uh, if you're actually trying to expose COM objects from a .NET library, is mark them as COM visible. And again, another attribute gets involved, the COM visible attribute. And in this particular case, we have a class. Uh, we're marking it as com visible. But you can also mark com visibility at the assembly level. And, and that, at that point, everything in that assembly would be com visible or not com visible. Interestingly, the default, if there's no attribute at all, is to make everything com visible. So if you compile your simple CS file into an assembly with no um, assembly level attributes, then every public class in that, that assembly would be com visible in theory. Now you're actually, in terms of exposing your classes to com, uh, there's two sort of main types of classes you can expose. Again, you can have an iUnknown style interface, which has iUnknown interfaces. This is usually defined by specifying this class interface attribute with a value of none, and then specifying an explicit list of interfaces, com interfaces you want to implement. But you can also do iDispatch based inf implementation. So iDispatch is a late binding for com, and it basically allows you to invoke functions by name. So you can do one or the other. The default, again, is a com class with no annotation at all is automatically iDispatchable. So again, if you don't do anything special, your assembly may contain both com visible and iDispatchable com objects in it. Now, registration is pretty simple. It's just basically com registration. So you run, you register an in-process server in the registry. You don't actually register the DLL directly. Instead, you register mscoreee.dll, which is kind of like a bootstrap for .NET in com. Uh, but in that registration, you also have the assembly name, the fully, fully qualified assembly name. You also have the class name you want to load. There is an optional code base attribute as well if you want to load the assembly from an actual file path instead of having to, it to be registered in the global assembly cache because obviously registering in the global assembly cache requires admin privileges. So when you're actually then trying to call an object, you need to do some marshalling. And obviously, the .NET types aren't necessarily the same 
as the com types. Now, things like uh, the blittable types, things like bytes and ints, they can just pretty much go straight across between the managed world and the unmanaged world. But things like bools, for example, booleans, they end up being, being converted to something called a variant bool, which has the wonderful property of true being minus one. I'm, I'm sure there's a good reason for that. I, I don't know. Um, Strings go to basic strings, which is sort of like a, a common counted string type in, in com. Objects become variants. Variants are a com construct which allows you to store any type of object or any type of value. So obviously it makes sense that that maps to object. And obviously your type arrays become a safe array of types. When you're actually doing iDispatch though, you don't directly sort of invoke, uh, you don't pass parameters directly sort of in RTX, RDX, etc., like you would if you were actually binding to a vtable. Instead, iDispatch takes a parameter, parameter list of variant types. So again, the .NET runtime defines which variant types convert to which other variant types. So there's the, the obvious ones like VT Bistra becomes a string. That seems to make sense. Probably the interesting one, which you'll, if you try and use this um, like from JScript, um, one of the weirdest behaviors you'll find is that um, the VT empty variant type maps to the .NET type of null. Okay, that's fine. But it actually defines to the J script undefined and VB script empty. Okay. Whereas the VT null maps to a special structure type called DB null, which is uh, used for databases. And that is actually mapped to J scripts null and VB scripts null. So if you try and pass null to a, as a parameter, in uh, JScript to a .NET object, it's probably not going to work so well because it's trying to pass a DB null, which is probably not what it expects. So let's actually do some interoperation. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, this first bit. I'm going to talk about sort of the genesis a bit much of the sort of .NET to JScript side. So the sort of how I came to realize that .NET to JScript would actually work. So if you look at my OLE view tool. You can look in the implemented categories at the .NET category, and there's loads and loads of entries. So there's, I think there's about sort of 50 or 60 at least .NET classes which are registered um, to be created from COM. And so all these are all pre-registered. They're all installed on a default install of Windows 10 or Windows 7. And all you need to do is they have a prog ID. So in, in a JScript context, you can just go new active X object or in VB script, you do create object. It all works. Well, except on a sort of standard install of Windows 10, it doesn't work quite so well. What you end up seeing is you'll see this dialogue and you go, oh, why does it not work? Well, it's just saying this object needs .NET 2, but you don't have .NET 2 installed because Windows 10, and I think Windows 8.1 didn't install .NET 2 by default. It only installed .NET 4. And that's a bit of a pain in the backside because obviously you need privileges to install .NET 2. And you can't rely on .NET 2 being installed. Fortunately, um, I, I managed to find a way of bypassing that. It turns out .NET has loads and loads of configuration knobs you can play with. Um, and these the names of these environment variables actually betray its history. So, so .NET kind of was born out of an extension of com plus and com plus was born out of an extension of com and these environment variables are actually com com plus underscore version which is kind of like okay they could have changed the name but i suppose it's too late now um but all you can do if you can set that in the environment so you can set it at the process level you don't need to put it in the registry you can then explicitly specify a version string so i want to run version 4 and even though that .NET object is supposed to be instantiated by v2, the, the runtime will make sure that v4 is loaded instead, and then you can get access to those com objects. So this is a way of getting v4 to bootstrap. Some people complain that it now requires wscript.shell. Well, unfortunate, but there we go. It was not designed for uh, you to sneak it past some uh, um, malicious code detector, I'm afraid. Anyway. Um, so you've got obviously now your, your objects being created. You can look at the definitions of these. Just look them up in MSDN because they, they're all going to be public classes. So they're probably documented in MSDN. If not, IL spy will probably tell you what parameters you can pass. So you just need to call it from J JavaScript or VB script. What could, what could possibly go wrong? Well, one scenario is this. 
If you have a function which takes, say, a string and an object, we can pass hello as the string, and as we saw before, uh, we can't pass null, well, we could pass null, but it's probably not what you're expecting it to do, because it would actually just box the db null into an object type, which is not what you actually want, you want it to pass null. So you pass undefined, and that works, you can call the call me function with a string and with null as the second parameter, great. But now you have a different function, which in this case, instead of taking an object type, takes a managed object type. This is just like a implemented class in .NET somewhere. Uh, say, for example, a stream object it could be taking. So you need to pass a stream object to this thing. But you still want to pass null to it because you don't actually care about this object or you can't create this object or you can't configure this object. You just want to pass null and just get it to do its thing. If you pass undefined to that, it will throw an exception. And this took me a while to sort of work out what the hell is going on with this. And it turns out that the object, as I said before, is just marshaled as a variant. So there's nothing stopping you marshaling VT empty as a variant. That just works. Unfortunately, an explicit object type marshals as a variant of VT dispatch or VT unknown. So it's marshaling specifically as a com object. And that isn't quite as accepted. Because if you go and look at the code, and this is actually, you can pull it out of core CLR. The core CLR pretty much has the majority of the com interop layer in, which is quite good. Um, you can see that it's trying to marshal a parameter here. And it's explicitly saying, if the variant type is not an unknown or not a dispatch, then I'm going to throw an exception. So the only way of getting a uh, passing null to one of these functions is to have a variant type or a variant which contains a VT unknown or a VT dispatch with a, z with a null pointer. And that seems probably something which would be pretty tricky to get in JScript because obviously if you can't pass null, how do you get null into an object? Well, it turns out you can just use a helper. So if you can find another com class which has, say, an access method which returns a concrete type, so, for example, it's, it returns ArrayList, which is a specific concrete class type in .NET. If it's passing that back as null, then that passes back a variant type of VT dispatch with a null pointer. And because now it's a VT dispatch, that a, the identity of it being an array ArrayList is just, just vanished. And as long as you don't do much manipulation with that, you can pass it back to .NET and it will then accept that as a null value for that parameter. Another common uh, core failure you will see is in this scenario. Imagine that that previous function, that previous call me function was already there with the two parameters, and that class also has a call me function with a single parameter. We just want to call it. Well, I'll just call call me with hello. That should work, shouldn't it? Unfortunately not. You'll get a exception again. In this case, it will tell you, sorry, you got the wrong number of arguments or something horrible has gone wrong. I'm not going to tell you anymore because that's, that's, that's all you're getting out of me. Um, and the reason for this is just down to the way that com and .NET are different. Specifically, .NET supports case sensitive names and parameter polymorphism for functions, whereas com does not, especially iDispatch, because iDispatch is just based on a single name. It's not based on what parameters you can pass to it. There's no way it could really determine that. So, what .NET does is it renames any duplicate names so that they're sort of unique in that particular context. So in this particular case, uh, it's sort of usually done in a, in, a, in a set order of definition, but sometimes it's not. It's really, really convoluted. Um, in this particular case, the secondary call me function is actually annotated as call me underscore two. So now in, J in JavaScript, we well, can't see it at the bottom. In JavaScript, you can now just call call me underscore two passing it the string, and that will now work, because you've now mapped to the correct function. And even if you can't quite work out the exact uh, naming, a good technique is literally just to write something which increments the number from two onwards until it stops throwing an exception, at which point, or at least throws a different exception. It may be, maybe not the one you want. Um, but yeah, I've, I've tried to write code to sort of determine that, and I've, I've looked at the code in the core CLR, and it depends on the type of object you are and whether it's implementing certain interfaces and well, what base class information it has. It's, it's really, really convoluted. So I put that all together as .NET to JScript. Basically, the ability to deserialize a delegate from a serialized stream because I found that binary formatter was accessible 
Viacom. And binary formatter allows you to deserialize pretty much any dot type of .NET object. So I deserialized the delegate, which pointed to uh, assembly.load, which then allowed you to load an arbitrary in-memory assembly and actually execute code in that. And therefore, effectively bootstrap arbitrary um, code as, as Casey was showing it, uh, earlier today. And that was great. But now, it's worth pointing out why I did this. Why did I write this tool in the first place? Because I'm not particularly well known for writing uh, like stuff for rats and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I wrote it to inject code into protected processes. Originally, for VirtualBox, I had... Um, VirtualBox has its own custom protected process trick, but obviously Windows also has protected process mechanisms. The protected process light specifically in, in modern versions of Windows. And the thing that protected processes do, they have sort of two security features. First, they will refuse to load code which isn't signed by Microsoft or isn't signed by certain types of certificates with certain EKUs. And secondary, it, it stops you. Even if you're an administrator, you can't open a protected process light process uh, for full access. You can't open it to write arbitrary executable memory into, into memory or create new threads or anything like that. So in theory, you can't inject code through DLL loading and you can't inject code through programmatic access. Um, but it's worth noting that obviously things like uh, ClipUp, which is uh, for the license manager. Obviously, the license managing needs to be protected from bad guys doing nasty things with licenses. Um, it loads loads of COM objects. And as we know, COM is easily hijackable. But of course, we can't just load a DLL. So what we do is we load a scriptlet. And a scriptlet contains JavaScript or JScript. And we can then bootstrap .NET to JScript. And crucially, while, say, script object DLL and JScript.dll and the .NET framework itself are all signed Microsoft code, all great, they will load into the PPL. Uh, our scriptlet code and our in-memory assembly are untrusted, but crucially completely unverified by any of the, the code integrity mechanisms going on. So we can execute arbitrary code inside a PPL. So let's quickly demo that. So this is a uh, bug which I have reported to Microsoft and they've decided not to fix. So uh, you can go nuts. So it's really, really simple. I call create PPL, which does all the magic. Um, hopefully it does all the magic. Okay, so I got a prompt. And again, I, I'm abusing the clip up uh, executable. Um, we can obviously see if we hover over that. So we've got clip up and if we look into the security tab, uh, you probably can't see it very well, but it is running as a protected process signer. Uh, in this particular case, it's running as Windows Signer uh, PPL. And obviously, uh, another thing to note on here, if you go to strings, if you click on the memory, it says, sorry, you can't do that. And I am running as an administrator. So literally, I cannot access this process. And this process contains arbitrary executable code, which I can control. Um, and of course, uh, just to add insult to injury, you also can't kill it either because... Why would you be able to? Um, so that's just unfortunate. Um, needless to say, uh, maybe Microsoft will, I think Microsoft might fix it in like a later, like later build. It's not something they want to service as a security bulletin, or at least that's what they claim. Uh, and the bug's open now, so too late. Anyway, um, so that was the registered classes, but I've, I've, I've pointed out again and again that any assembly effectively on the system could contain com accessible .NET classes. One way of getting access to these would just be to stick them in the registry, but putting them in the registry just feels dirty and like really it would be ideal not, not to have to do that if I, if I could get away with it. So I, uh, reading around a bit, I noticed that, um, Activation context manifest, which do, which can be used for things like registration free com, supports a specific CLR class element. And the CLR class element allows you to load .NET types as if they were com objects. So obviously in this particular case, we have an assembly identity. So we want to load from the system, uh, the system assembly, which doesn't by default have any registered com objects. And in this case, we want to run system.net.webclient, uh, which I'm sure people are very familiar with, with the sort of PowerShell abuse. And effectively, you can kind of do the same, similar abuse with uh, system.net.webclient, uh, 
uh, in JScript if you so desire. Now, the question is then, how do you even load that? Well, uh, Katie uh, documented a way of loading arbitrary manifests, and it's using a sort of almost hidden uh, com class, uh, the activation context class. And from that, you can specify an explicit manifest file. So in this case, just a file on disk. You can also specify it as a text string, although you need to make sure it's uh, correctly UTF-8 encoded, otherwise it doesn't load. You can even do it from a URL. Now, this manifest file still gets dropped to disk, so it's not like super surreptitious and getting in uh, just loading from memory. But it means that at least you don't have to drop a file with the, the binary itself. And then on that ActiveX, uh, activation context object, just call create object with the prog ID and it will create you that .NET object. So I was went looking for interesting com objects. And one of the things which I found most interesting is almost like it literally is a class which allows you to access your computer for the most part. And it's part of the Visual Basic libraries. And uh, here's some of the examples of things you can do. Uh, for example, you can get full registry access. Um, to everything basically, create, create keys, uh, delete keys, uh, types, etc. Um, and this is obviously all without loading wscript.shell, which is the, the com way of, of, uh, the classic com way of doing that. Uh, you can manipulate the clipboard, you can read stuff off the clipboard, set the clipboard if you like. Uh, you can send arbitrary keys to the focused application, the sort of send keys and notepad trick. Um, you can even play loud noises at people uh, for the audio player, uh, which is great. And it has a few other fun functions as, on there as well. Um, so why not demo that? A little simple demo. Um, I've actually, I wrote some um, tools to uh, sort of enumerate accessible com types. So if I just, just run that, oops, ah, okay. I think I uh, forgot to install the, there's a, there's a GAC assembly uh, library which you can install and I've forgotten to install that, but um, it doesn't really matter for this, uh, for the actual demo case. Um, in this particular case, I've got a uh, program called clipboard.js and it's quite complicated, um, but all this is going to do is sit there in an infinite loop, um, waiting a second every time and just checking the clipboard. Hey, is there anything new pasted to the clipboard? And then just then stealing it, right? Um, so if I just run clipboard, okay, so I don't know. I have super secret password and I'm copying it out of my, uh, my password manager and you probably can't yeah and so it obviously it just sits there and hoovering up your clipboard um and this is obviously not running um the full uh a full .NET assembly this is literally just calling com objects which are actually exposed from .NET. um another demo uh, i can run is uh if you ever wanted to display a, a gui um you can run Windows Forms or parts of Windows Forms. <laughs> I've not found out a way of actually setting the events. I think you can if you're just running uh, Windows Scripting Host and these were registered, but there's, I, it's quite tricky to get that to work. Um, so yeah, um, this actually probably won't work because it's not actually there, but like you can even get, um, you can even have your own web browser. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got network access, so I can't go to a but yeah, you can um, obviously have nice GUI interfaces now to your JScript scripts and uh, use Windows Forms. <laughs> I know it's what you always wanted, right? <laughs> so um, I will try and get around to releasing my sort of analysis uh, tools to pull out com objects because on a default system, there's about 230 potential com objects you could access through the registration free com trick. If you have Visual Studio installed and all manner of other stuff, there's loads of assemblies installed on that and there's loads of extra com attack surface. And if you install OpenOffice, for some reason they've got some com interop libraries which have like, they forgot to market com accessible false, com access false, and so everything is com accessible, which is kind of fun. Um, if you, you can look at the source code for .NET to JScript. If you want to look at more at the PPR bypass, my uh, ish, uh, report on the issue tracker is up there.
And if you want to learn more about uh, Donna Introp uh, in semi-gory details, then the MSDN is usually your, your port of call. There's an entire section just on Donna Introp. And there's various things which are massively confusing, and reading that probably won't help you. But it's worth a try, right? Um, now, I think I've probably not got enough time for questions, but obviously I'm going to be around for the next few days. So if you do have any particular questions on this, then uh, grab me whenever you need to. So thanks very much for listening, and uh, have a good evening. <laughs> <laughs>